All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I do want to introduce our next speaker, Dr. John R. Windle is professor and chief of the Division of Cardiology at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Dr. Windell is also the director of the Biomedical Informatics Program at UNMC. His research involves the adoption of the electronic health record and computerized decision support, and he is actively engaged in patient-centered care initiatives, including shared decision-making. And his lecture today is Physician Patient Engagement and Shared Decision Making. In fact, the gallery directly behind our theater directly pertains to uh, what Dr. Wendell will be talking about this afternoon. So please help us welcome Dr. Wendell. Thanks Thank you. for being here. I guess at the beginning of every lecture, it's important to talk about relationships with industry. And uh, my wife and I have been married 32 years. She's now working with WebMD. But for a number of years, she has worked in drug information. I don't think you're going to see enough in this to be of concern. Um, as we look at this project, what we're looking at is really uh, understanding the driving forces for patient engagement and patient education a review of kind of the major trials that have been out there in patient education, and finally to create a dialogue about uh, shared decision making and patient engagement. Uh, patient engagement and patient shared decision making and patient centered care is a little bit like talking about mom and apple pie. We ought to really, of course, be for it, and I think most of us practice it. But what we're learning about is that there have been some changes over time that we can think about and incorporate. So if we look at the evolution of patient education, we start with, of course, Marcus Welby in the 60s. And at that time, the show before him was Father Knows Best. Well, at that time, physicians had the general concept that we could go in and tell people exactly what they needed to do uh, and that they would do it. And in fact, sometimes prescriptions did not even have the medication or the dosage. They really didn't need it. Well, with the Vietnam War and everything, we started to get more open. We actually included nurses in our uh, process. But it still, in terms of patient education, was very much a medical-centered care, uh, leaving against advice, not doing what we said. Um, in the 80s and 90s, we really learned about starting to share more with the patients and bring them in, and there became a movement about ethics and morality and legality about patient education. And in fact, in, in 2010, one of the things that uh, attorneys will talk about is that informed consent is one of the major concerns that comes through in terms of how you have done things. Did they really understand what was going on? Um, and I think we need to be ahead of that game as well. So the Institute of Medicine has defined six key areas for quality. And we're not going to read through all of them today, but they talk about is the care safe? Is it effective? And then we're going to talk more about is it patient-centered? Is it timely? Is it efficient and equitable? So the Institute of Medicine's definition of patient-centered is providing care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values and ensuring that patient values guide all clinical decisions. And I'm going to come back at this at the end to talk a little bit about where I think things need to head. So why is it important to talk about cardiovascular disease? We're all at the ACC. I think we understand. 16.7 million deaths worldwide, but much of the burden of cardiovascular disease is preventable. Uh, smoking, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, poor nutritional habits, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes. Many of these are treatable and preventable. Um, early detection can cause a significant reduction in mortality. So as we look at meetings like this where we've seen over the past decade a 30% reduction in death and disability from cardiovascular disease, unfortunately not enough has come from the patient side of things in my perspective. Uh, I didn't have room in this slide collection to look at the Cochrane Collaboration showing the amount of obesity uh, over the last 50 years and the explosion uh, of obesity. And that's been followed uh, by loss of activity. 
one of the, I was on the governor's task force for health promotions and physical fitness, and what I learned is we couldn't really ask people to exercise. That was outside the scope. But if we look at current patient education, it's kind of scary to see what happens. First off, only 14% of spoken instructions are remembered. Uh, if you think about this, uh, it, it is really the sort of thing that causes troubles because it's not that you're not telling them, it's that they don't recite it. Too many standard teaching materials are above the medical knowledge level of the participants. And surprisingly, 77% don't even really feel that they own their own health care. 12% believe that they're passive uh, recipients of health care. 29% don't feel that they have enough facts to judge. And 46% have the facts but don't have the confidence to act on their own. So as we look at this, this is a pretty large gap to close. And I think sets some good precedents for where we should be heading. Um, I thought this was a study that came out last month. Um, and in this study, they asked 472 patients, uh, tell me about your coronary disease and stenting. Um, they also looked at a group of patients with elevated PSAs in the urologists. Only 16% reported the doctor had asked them about their preferences in health care. 10% reported that the physician discussed any alternatives as serious options. Um, and this is substantial worse than urologists who were up in the 50 to 60% range talking about alternatives. So this is a very recent document that says that patients are either not hearing, not understanding, or we're not doing a very effective job communicating. Uh, so as we look at this, I think this sets a challenge for us. Um, now if you look at randomized trials support multidisciplinary teams improving health care, uh, readmission rates. Uh, there's also collaborative and proactive studies demonstrating that uh, communication in hypertension uh, in diabetics appears to improve hypertension control. And then in a very recent paper, Dr. Allen and colleagues looked at shared decision-making in congestive heart failure and talked about all the potential advantages. And I would refer you to that document for a very nice overview of the subject. Uh, and that was just in circulation uh, this past week. But as we look at this, there is also an increasing a number of papers that show where it doesn't work. Um, Antithrombotic therapy is someone who loves decision support systems and works. Uh, they, in, in the UK, they had a decision support system for anticoagulation use, and they gave it to half the patients, and the other half had traditional. Now, the 50% of patients that had the decision support were very satisfied with it, uh, they didn't have a lot of conflict with their doctors, but they also didn't take the antithrombotic therapy. So even while there's a lot of satisfaction from an end user perspective, the actual compliance with the guidelines was worse than traditional care. And then equally concerning is when you look at going beyond patient satisfaction. Um, how many of you know about HCAPs and the role of HCAPs coming in the future? This is the CMS mandate in the United States that reimbursement will be tied back to how much the patients like us. The more they like us, how they think we've communicated, we're going to get paid more. Well, this is an example where in, in a low-income, uh, low-education patients, they did shared decision-making, and materials were given to them. The patients confirmed that they had much better con communication about their disease process. They were very satisfied with their care, but ultimately it did not result in better hypertension control. So even though we have happier, better informed patients, and ultimately we have to have the target that it makes a difference in outcomes. Just like the last speaker was talking about BNP, we have to prove that effective therapies. Further, as we look at this, um, if we look at randomized control trials and, and the analysis. Um, eight of 11 studies demonstrated that shared decision making and, and patient engagement led to a better quality of life using a disease specific quality of life tool. So if we said, how's your heart failure doing? We said, better. But only one of the five trials showed an actual difference in overall quality of life 
as measured by the FS36. Um, two out of four showed a reduction in heart failure readmissions, but only two out of eight demonstrated a reduction in all-cause mortality. And only one of nine studies demonstrated a, or excuse me, reduction in all-cause mortality. So as we're doing this, we're just starting to get engaged in this process. Um, we have a lot to learn to be effective. So why are there discrepancies between something that ought to be so desirable, uh, patient engagement and shared decision making? Number one, it's a very early science. So the techniques are still emerging and we don't have good definitions from study to study. That's why so many randomized control trials ha are not applicable one to another. There's inadequate provider education about this process. And one of the things today and otherwise and in the back is really getting us to understand what's out there. Uh, number three is oftentimes we do not effectively understand the level of the patient engagement and understanding. And we'll look at this in a little in another slide. And there's inadequate co coordination of provider services that I'll talk about. Um, the best practices in e-health have not been established. And finally, uh, I'll finish up by talking about I think there's inadequate requirements uh, for patient engagement. So Dr. John Spertus, who's been a leader in cardiovascular disease looking at outcomes and measures, uh, puts together, talks about the health status in this uh, paper. And what he identifies it's, is if you look at the disease, you have a myocardial infarction with heart failure. Well, to the patient side of things, they see their symptoms. They don't go out and say, I've got an infarction and I've got heart failure. They say, I'm fatigued, I'm short of breath when I exert myself and I have edema. So that's the symptoms. The functional limitations can occur at the level of physical limitations, mental limitations, or emotional. And finally, all of this goes together to, to culminate in a quality of life. And quality of life is very, very interesting from my perspective. Uh, one of the things I do every year is I talk to the first year medical students about life and death and, and end of life care and so forth. And when I talk about quality of life, um, they're going to turn around and have told me, you know, if I had to use crutches every day, I would have a horrible quality of life. Well, that's versus the patients we take care of in their 80s and 90s. And uh, my mother used a walker for 10 years. She was limited to about 50 feet. Uh, and to the day she died, she would have said she had a great quality of life. So you have to use this as the metrics to, to get in, involved in this. And so we talked about the health status measures. Then there's health literacy. And I thought this was a very interesting study to go back to reflect versus our poor performance in terms of patients really understanding and engaging. And this used two standardized medical knowledge uh, scoring systems. And they went through with 100 patients. And what they were able to demonstrate is that older patients have a lower score and substantially lower than younger patients. That not surprising to us, those of us who've been married 32 years, women score better at understanding these things than we do. Uh, but there was no racial difference. And one of the things that came out is if you needed assistance with medications, that's a clear sign that you needed help with other things. And when they looked at this, what they're able to demonstrate is there was a large gap in our understanding that in many cases, we needed to have education, medical knowledge education, not overall education, as, as a scoring system to help us with engaging the patients. We need to put it at the right level. Then I thought this was a, an interesting thing for us that are subspecialists. This is on the oncology literature, but it was a survey of patients, primary care providers, and oncologists uh, on four questions. Uh, who should be treating your primary cancer? Who should be screening you for secondary cancers? Who should be managing you for your health care problems that crop up? And who should be doing your health care maintenance? Well, there was almost no concordance in any of those. 
So the oncologists and the primary care providers had very different expectations of what they would be managing. The oncologists believed they should manage all the primary care cancers, but they also should be responsible for all the secondary screening. The primary care provider really thought they should have, be pretty active in the primary cancer, and they should be doing on the, all, all the oncologic screening. Clearly, when it came to things like who should be taking care of my cold, there wasn't a lot of discord over who did that. But the patient had different expectations from both of them. And I think as we look at this, this is a paradigm that we need to consider in cardiology, especially as we go into accountable care organizations, is who's going to be managing their lipids, their hypertension, and the other disease processes as we go forward. Now, let's look at e-health initiatives because I think this is another area where it's very important uh, to think about what the future is. In 2009, 1.6 billion people had access to the Internet. In Europe, 71% of Internet users use it for healthcare information. 79% of adults in the U.S. use the Internet for health information, and 39% are using so social media. However, there is a big gap in older patients and those with lower education and economics. So one of the things I look at is a survey that said when physicians are approached with patients who bring in information, there are three responses. Number one, hey, I'm the expert. Um, you shouldn't be looking out there. Number two is what are reliable websites and how do you engage the patient in reliable websites? And then the third is really that shared decision making where together you look at the information and you build an internet-based or an e-health uh, kind of support system that you both agree with. Um, and I thought this was a good quote to kind of summarize. With the growth of new and exciting health information technology opportunities, however, comes the daunting responsibility to design interoperable, easy-to-use, engaging, and accessible e-health applications that communicate the right information needed to guide the health care and health promotion of diverse audiences. And I do think that this is the challenge out there as we do this. Um, we're going to get the top 10% engaged, but it's the others that are at issue. Now I want to go back to the Institute of Medicine and finish up with this. The Institute of Medicine talked about providing care, talking about patient preferences, and patient's value guide guides our therapy. Honestly, I don't like this definition because it's all about passive. It's all of us being measured on how well we're liked. And so as we do this, I'm really a big proponent of patient engagement. That's an active process. I want you not only to understand that we're giving you a summary at the end of your visit, but that you're actually reading it and we're getting information back that says that you understand that. And I believe that active patient engagement also means the patient takes responsibility and ownership with us. That they are responsible to prepare for clinic, interact, monitor their care, follow up, and take ownership for their health. And what comes out of that, I think, is, is a couple things that the responsibility of health care providers caring for people with, in this case, diabetes or cardiovascular disease now extends far beyond the traditional tasks of diagnosis. It includes informing patients, training them to acquire the required skills, and using all the means necessary to improve each one's motivation for treatment and monitoring. And I think this is a pretty good sentinel call in 2001 for where we go. So if we look at this, and, and we take Dr. Spurtis' model of disease, symptoms, functional limitations, and quality of life. And if we pair that with the physicians who are using evidence-based medicine and guidelines, history and physical and diagnostic testing to come up with a diagnosis, come up with therapeutic options, then between the therapeutic options and the patient comes the plan. You share in the plans, and then the ownership is also shared with them. So in conclusion, it is critical to include shared decision making and in patient in your practice. Ascertain the patient's medical knowledge levels, obtain an understanding of the patient's preferences for care, 
bring the patient into the decision-making process. Uh, but I think one important caveat is don't allow them to get you to practice bad medicine. When I talk to the house staff, it is not infrequent they say, well, the patient wants. Um, that comes in the last step. So if we go back, this is what I try to teach them. This process should be separate from this until you've come up with your medical answers and your medical decisions. Document that you've done shared decision making. And finally, get the patient as an active participant. And besides the Phillips demonstration here, the ACC has an entire committee on patient-centered care, and I would encourage you to get involved there. Uh, so I guess at this point, if we have a few moments for questions. Um, actually, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions here. Can you be available offline? I, I, I would be happy questions? to meet with anyone afterwards. Thank you Fantastic. very much. How about a nice thank you for Dr. Windle? Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate that.